Gaspar Ruiz, who could with ease bend apart the heavy iron bars of the prison, was led out with the others to summary execution. Every bullet has its billet, runs the proverb. All the merit of proverbs consists in the concise and picturesque expression, and the surprise of our minds is found their persuasiveness. In other words, we are struck and convinced by the shock. What surprises us is the form, not the substance. Proverbs are art, cheap art. As a general rule, they are not true, unless indeed they happen to be mere platitudes. As, for instance, the proverb, half a loaf of bread is better than no bread, or a miss is as good as a mile. Some proverbs are simply imbecile, others are immoral. That one evolved out of the naive heart of the great Russian people. Man discharges the peace, but God carries the bullet, is piously atrocious, and at bitter variance with the accepted conception of a compassionate God. It would indeed be an inconsistent occupation for the guardian of the poor, the innocent, and the helpless to carry the bullet, for instance, into the heart of a father. Gaspar Ruiz was childless. He had no wife, and he had never been in love. He had hardly ever spoken to a woman, beyond his mother and the ancient negress of the household, whose wrinkled skin was the color of cinders, and whose lean body was bent double from age. If some bullets from those muskets fired off at fifteen paces were specifically destined for the heart of Gaspar Ruiz, they all missed their billet. One, however, carried away a small piece of his ear, another a fragment of flesh from his shoulder. A red and unclouded sun setting into a purple ocean looked with a fiery stare upon the enormous wall of the Cordilleries, worthy witnesses of his glorious extinction. But it is inconceivable that it should have seen the ant-like men busy with their absurd and insignificant trials of killing and dying for reasons that, apart from being generally childish, were also imperfectly understood. It did light up, however, the backs of the firing party and the faces of the condemned men. Some of the men had fallen on their knees, others remained standing, a few averted their heads from the leveled barrels of muskets. Gaspar Ruiz, upright, the burliest of them all, hung his big shock head. The low sun dazzled him a little, and he counted himself a dead man already. He fell at the first discharge. He fell because he thought he was a dead man. He struck the ground heavily. The jar of the fall surprised him. I am not dead, apparently, he thought to himself, when he heard the execution platoon reloading its arms at the word of a command. It was then the hope of escape dawned upon him for the first time. He remained lying stretched out with rigid limbs under the weight of two bodies collapsed crosswise upon his back. By the time the soldiers had fired a third volley into the slightly stirring heaps of the slain, the sun had gone out of sight, and almost immediately, with the darkening of the lowlands, the snowy peaks of the Cordillera remained luminous and crimson for a long time. The soldiers, before marching back to the fort, sat down to smoke. The sergeant, with a naked sword in his hand, strolled away by himself, along the heap of the dead. He was a humane man, and watched for any stir or twitch of limb, and the merciful idea of plunging the point of his blade into any body, giving the slightest sign of life. But none of the bodies afforded him an opportunity for the display of this charitable intention. Not a muscle twitched amongst them. Not even the powerful muscles of Gaspar Ruiz, who, deluged with the blood of his neighbors and shamming death, strove to appear more lifeless than the others. 
He was lying face down. The sergeant recognized him by his stature, and being himself a very small man, looked with envy and contempt at the prostration of so much strength. He had always disliked that particular soldier. Moved by an obscure animosity, he inflicted a long gash across the neck of Gaspar Ruiz, with some vague notion of making sure of that strong man's death, as if a powerful physique were more able to resist the bullets. For the sergeant had no doubt that Gaspar Ruiz had been shot through in many places. Then he passed on, and shortly afterwards marched off with his men, leaving the bodies to the care of crows and vultures. Gaspar Ruiz had restrained a cry, though it had seemed to him that his head was cut off at a blow. And when darkness came, shaking off the dead, whose weight had oppressed him, he crawled away over the plain on his hands and knees. After drinking deeply, like a wounded beast at a shallow stream, he assumed an upright posture, and staggered on, light-headed and aimless, as if lost amongst the stars of the clear night. A small house seemed to rise out of the ground before him. He stumbled into the porch, and struck at the door with his fist. There was not a gleam of light. Gaspar Ruiz might have thought that the inhabitants had fled from it, as from many others in the neighborhood, had it not been for the shouts of abuse that answered his thumping. In his feverish and enfeebled state, the angry screaming seemed to him part of a hallucination belonging to the weird, dreamlike feeling of his unexpected condemnation to death, of the thirst suffered, of the volleys fired at him within fifteen paces, of his head being cut off at a blow. Open the door, he cried, open in the name of God. An infuriated voice from within jeered at him. Come in, come in, the house belongs to you, all this land belongs to you, come and take it. For the love of God, Gaspar murmured. Does not all the land belong to you, patriots? The voice on the other side of the door screamed on. Are you not a patriot? Gaspar Ruiz did not know. I am a wounded man, he said apathetically. All became still inside. Gaspar Ruiz lost the hope of being admitted and lay down under the porch just outside the door. He was utterly careless of what was going to happen to him. All his consciousness seemed to be concentrated in his neck, where he felt a severe pain. His indifference as to his fate was genuine. The day was breaking when he awoke from a feverish doze. The door at which he had knocked in the dark stood wide open now, and a girl, steadying herself with her outspread arms, leaned over the threshold. Lying on his back, he stared up at her. Her face was pale and her eyes were very dark. Her hair hung down, black as ebony, against her white cheeks. Her lips were full and red. Beyond her he saw another head, with long gray hair and a thin old face with a pair of anxiously clasped hands under the chin. I knew those people by sight, General Santiago would tell his guests at the dining table. I mean the people with whom Gaspar found shelter. The father was an old Spaniard, a man of property, ruined by the revolution. His estates, his house in town, his money, everything he had in the world had been confiscated by proclamation, for he was a bitter foe of our independence. From a position of great dignity and influence on the Viceroy's Council, he became of less importance than his own Negro slaves made free by our glorious revolution. He had not even the means to flee the country, as other Spaniards had managed to do. It may be that, wandering ruined and houseless and burdened with nothing but his life, which was left to him by the clemency of the provisional government, had simply walked under that broken roof of old tiles. It was a lonely spot. There did not seem to be even a dog belonging to the place. 
but though the roof had holes, as if a cannonball or two had dropped through it, the wooden shutters were thick and tight closed at the time. My way took me frequently along the path in front of that miserable rancho. I rode from the fort to the town almost every evening to sigh at the window of a lady I was in love with then. When one is young, you understand. She was a good patriot, you may be sure. Caballeros, credit me or not, political feeling ran so high in those days that I do not believe I could have been fascinated by the charms of a woman of royalist opinions. Murmurs of abuse, incredulity all round the table interrupted the general, and while they lasted, he stroked his white beard gravely. Senors, he protested, a royalist was a monster to our overwrought feelings. I am telling you this in order not to be suspected of the slightest tenderness towards the old royalist daughter. Moreover, as you know, my affections were engaged elsewhere, but I could not help noticing her on rare occasions when, with the front door open, she stood in the porch. You must know that this old royalist was as crazy as a man can be. His political misfortunes, his total downfall and ruin, had disordered his mind. To show his contempt for what we patriots could do, he affected to laugh at his imprisonment, at the confiscation of his lands, the burning of his houses, and the misery to which he and his womenfolk were reduced. This habit of laughing had grown upon him, so that he would begin to laugh and shout directly he caught sight of any stranger. That was the form of his madness. I, of course, disregarded the noise of that madman, with that feeling of superiority the success of our cause inspired in us Americans. I suppose I really despised him because he was an old Castilian, a Spaniard born, and a royalist. Those were certainly no reasons to scorn a man, but for centuries Spaniards born had shown their contempt of us Americans, men as well descended as themselves, simply because we were what they called colonists. We had been kept in a basement and made to feel our inferiority in the social intercourse. And now it was our turn. It was safe for us patriots to display the same sentiments. And I, being a young patriot, son of a patriot, despised that old Spaniard, and despising him, I naturally discharged his abuse, though it was annoying to my feelings. Others, perhaps, would not have been so forbearing. He would begin with a great yell, I see a patriot, another of them, long before I came abreast of the house. The tone of his senseless revilings mingled with outbursts of laughter, was sometimes piercingly shrill and sometimes grave. It was all very mad. But I felt it incumbent upon my dignity to check my horse to a walk without even glancing towards the house, as if that man's abusive clamor in the porch were less than the barking of a cur. I rode by, preserving an expression of haughty indifference on my face. It was no doubt very dignified, but I should have done better if I had kept my eyes open. A military man in wartime should never consider himself off duty, and especially so if the war is a revolutionary war, when the enemy is not at the door, but within your very house. At such times the heat of passionate convictions, passing into hatred, removes the restraints of honor and humanity from many men of delicacy and fear from some women. These last, when once they throw off the timidity and reserve of their sex, become by the vivacity of their intelligence and the violence of their merciless resentment more dangerous than so many armed giants. The general's voice rose, but his big hand stroked his white beard with an effect of venerable calmness. See, si, senors, women are ready to rise to the heights of devotion unattainable by us men. 
or to sink into the depths of a basement which amazes our masculine prejudices. I am speaking now of exceptional women, you understand? Here one of the guests observed that he had never met a woman yet who was not capable of turning out quite exceptional under circumstances that would engage her feelings strongly. That sort of superiority and recklessness they have over us, he concluded, make of them the more interesting half of mankind. The general, who bore the interruption with gravity, nodded courteous assent. See, si, see, si. under circumstances, precisely. They can do an infinite deal of mischief sometimes in quite unexpected ways, for who could have imagined that a young girl, daughter of a ruined royalist whose life itself was held only by the contempt of his enemies, would have had the power to bring death and devastation upon two flourishing provinces and cause serious anxiety to the leaders of the revolution and the very hour of its success. He paused to let the wonder of it penetrate our minds. Death and devastation, somebody murmured in surprise. How shocking! The old general gave a glance in the direction of the murmur and went on. Yes, that is war, calamity. But the means by which she obtained the power to work this havoc on our southern frontier seemed to me, who have seen her and spoken to her, still more shocking. That particular thing left in my mind a dreadful amazement, which the further experience of life of more than fifty years has done nothing to diminish. He looked round as if to make sure of our attention, and in a changed voice, I am, as you know, a Republican, son of a liberator, he declared. My incomparable mother, God rest her soul, was a French woman, the daughter of an ardent Republican. As a boy I fought for liberty. I have always believed in the equality of men. And as to their brotherhood, that, to my mind, is even more certain. Look at the fierce animosity they display in their differences. And what in the world do you know that is more bitterly fierce than brothers' quarrels? All absence of cynicism checked an inclination to smile at this view of human brotherhood. On the contrary, there was in the tone the melancholy natural to a man profoundly humane at heart, who from duty, from conviction, and from necessity had played his part in scenes of ruthless violence. The general had seen much of fratricidal strife. Certainly there is no doubt of their brotherhood, he insisted. All men are brothers, and as such know almost too much of each other. But, and here the, in the old patriarchal head, white as silver, the black eyes humorously twinkled, as if we are all brothers, all the women are not our sisters. One of the younger guests was heard murmuring his satisfaction at that fact, but the general continued with deliberate earnestness. They are so very different. The tale of a king who took a beggar maid for a partner of his throne may be pretty enough as we men look upon ourselves and upon love. But that a young girl, famous for her haughty beauty, only a short time before, the admired of all the, the balls of the viceroy's palace, should take by the hand a guasso, a common peasant, is intolerable to our sentiment of women and their love. It is madness. Nevertheless, it happened. But it must be said that in her case it was the madness of hate, not of love. After presenting this excuse in a spirit of chivalrous justice, the general remained silent for a time. I rode past the house every day almost, he began again, and this was what was going on within. But how it was going on, no mind of man can conceive. Her desperation must have been extreme, and Gaspar Ruiz was a docile fellow. He had been an obedient soldier. His strength was like an enormous stone lying on the ground. 
ready to be hurled this way by the hand that picks it up. It is clear that he would tell his story to the people who gave him the shelter he needed, and he needed assistance badly. His wound was not dangerous, but his life was forfeited. The old royalist being wrapped up in his laughing madness, the two women arranged a hiding place for the wounded man in one of the huts amongst the fruit trees at the back of the house. That hovel, an abundance of clear water while the fever was on him, and some words of pity, were all they could give. I suppose he had a share of what food there was, and it would be but little, a handful of roasted corn, perhaps a dish of beans, or a piece of bread with a few figs, to such misery were those proud and once wealthy people reduced. 